Uh, let's go right into it. So Absolutely. First, uh, I always like to give kind of a, you know, a quick intro as to why we do this. I think it's really important for us to all come together as, um, as people, we can't do so in person, but virtually is really, really important. And so the goal of the live stream is to connect, right? Is to connect with constituents, the people who have questions and overall to just people who are online. So I wanted to make sure that we answered people's questions um, in a really efficient way. And we get all kinds of questions we get questions about rent and unemployment and noise and, of course, the future of our healthcare system and what people can do to make sure that they stay safe. And so I know that you, uh, Dr. Kwok, have been on the front lines during this pandemic, and I'm really, really happy that you're here. Um, uh, we did receive a few questions over the weekend, and I, uh, I shared some of them with you. Um, but as we see some more kind of in the chat box, we are really going to try and make sure that we answer those as well. Uh, I want to let everyone know uh, that you, you know we're still we still have many many cases. We'll st we're still taking um, uh, volunteers. We have people who are making calls remotely, but also we have individuals who have really come out with us in the field to deliver food to people's homes. We want to make sure that everyone's safe. You get a mask, you get gloves, uh, but that. Um, people know that we're still there for them and we're still serving them. And I know that we see a lot of things in the media about, uh, you know, is the city reopening and what does that mean? And we'll cover that a little bit today. So I wanna let everyone know you can contact our office uh, by email at district2 at council.nyc.gov. Of course, you could visit my council website. I wanna just um, wanna make sure that uh, before we get into this week's topic, that I say many, many thank yous to LES Ready, to Vision Urbana, to Food Bank, to our local hospital systems, and to just let everyone know that I'm really, really thankful for them. So we were having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I wanna make sure that I share a couple things. If you'll just bear with me, everyone, including Dr. Kwok, who's been incredibly, incredibly patient today. So I want to make sure. Hmm. Let's see if I can share it to my council. We're doing it a little bit differently today. Um, Things happen. Things happen and you gotta take it in stride. Great. So, um, all right, great. So thank you so much, great. So we, again, we got a lot of questions and I know people have been asking me about social distancing, about wearing masks, about are we going to change the way that we uh, serve people and take care of patients. So we're gonna get right into it. Uh, I want to make sure also that people know how to follow you. They can follow you on Twitter, right? Quacky Talky. Quacky Talky. <laughs> you can spell it out later on, but I want everyone to know that um, they can follow you, they can support you, and later on we're going to talk about how to support our frontline workers, and I know you've been working on something um, in terms of messages and keeping up morale. So for everyone who's watching, Dr. Ian Kwok is a resident physician at Mount Sinai Beth Israel who has been working to treat COVID-19 patients since cases first started emerging in New York City in March. And in the little free time that Dr. Kwok has had these past months, he helped launch the Thank Hospital Heroes campaign to help New Yorkers send messages of thanks and support for our hospital and healthcare heroes during COVID-19. We'll include more information about that campaign in the comments section and I'm proud to know uh, Dr. Kwok and to have him on tonight. I know we met, I guess it's years ago at this yeah. point. It's a, it's a Loisida resident, you know. Um, yes. You know, I'm here, you know, not on behalf of Mount Sinai or Beth Israel. 
Um, you know, I'm here as a neighbor. Um, you know, I know at this at these times, it's really important that we have, um, you know, our community to back us up and to help take care of each other. So uh, I really appreciate Carlina, you know, what you're doing for the community and uh, creating ways that we can still be connected, you know, like this, um, despite, you know, the uh, distancing. Exactly. So and I and I appreciate you being here again. This is like our our local doctor. Um, let's start right away. So our, our Alberto Mercado, he sent me a question. Where can I get COVID-19 testing and what are the different kinds of tests? I hear about antibody testing and PCR testing. Are there other kinds? Can you walk us through what the testing process is like? Absolutely, sure. So that's a great question. I know there's a lot of different tests out there. Uh, so this is definitely something that comes up a lot. Um, there are two general main types of tests. There's the antigen test and there's antibody test. So the antigen test, um, that is like the standard COVID test. Um, PCR is um, a part of the, uh, I guess the way that the lab tests um, and actually uses the material. So it's basically just a form of antigen testing. So um, for most people, antigen testing is the most important testing because that means that's really showing if you actually have the active uh, disease. Um, the antibody testing um, is much kind of a difficult thing to, to really describe because it really, we don't know that much about it just yet. So um, for, I think the most important message is that if you're concerned that you have coronavirus, the antigen test, the normal test, the PCR test, um, sometimes, sometimes it's called the rapid test, uh, that is the test you need. And that's the test that we're trying to make widely available to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, the antibody test, um, we don't really have great recommendations for how it should be used just yet. So the antibody is what your body produces in response to having the coronavirus. Um, so if you have it, it means you had it at some point, but doesn't necessarily mean that you have it now or that you're immune from it. Um, so it's not necessarily very helpful and practical for you. It is very helpful and practical for the health system and for uh, the city and the state because then it helps us kind of learn more information about it. So if it's offered to you, I think it's still something worth considering. Um, but um, I would not recommend everyone get screened with the antibody test uh, at this time right now. Um, in terms of where you can get tested, um, I think there are, it, the, fortunately, the test is much more broadly available now. So um, at most urgent care centers should have it. Um, there's also a website um, that's run by New York City um, and New York State, um, as well as a helpline. So uh, if I think the easiest way is to go online, but uh, if you don't have access to a computer, um, or if you have someone who has uh, who would like to get access, there's also a hotline. It's eight four four NYC for NYC. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, yes, exactly. There is a hotline that uh, you can call and ask questions. Of course, you can always call three one one, and they'll route you to that number as well to make sure they address your concerns. And so, Dr. Kwok is is the there's uh, two other words that I always hear to describe testing as well, diagnostic and serology. Okay. Are, do people use them interchangeably? Diagnostic is the rapid test to determine if you are currently infectious. Right, and so infectious serology just means it's from the blood. So a blood test can be diagnostic. It can be uh, for other reasons as well. So um, that doesn't specifically say anything. Um, the, um, the rapid test, um, is pretty much what we are trying to roll out everywhere now. Um, and that's the one that they usually do through either the nose or the mouth, um, but can also be done in other ways as well. So this is a little bit of a follow-up question from, and you addressed it a little bit from Preeti. She said, should only certain people like those with underlying conditions get an antibody test right now? Um, so the antibody test, um, as I mentioned, it's a little bit difficult to really say how helpful that is for everyone. Um, so I don't recommend it broadly. Uh, but if you think that you are someone who might benefit from it, uh, someone who, um, you know, if you ha having had that disease in the past um, may affect kind of your, your health now in some way. Um, I know that's a little bit vague, but I would really uh, ask you to bring that up with your doctor if you are, are still concerned. Um, it's usually not very useful um, in terms of actually changing your behavior. Um, because even if it's positive, 
even if you've had antibodies, it doesn't mean you should still not be distancing and uh, should still not be, uh, you know, obviously it, if it affects your health or the health of people directly around you, uh, I think it's still something worth considering. Um, so unfortunately, it's a little bit of a gray area. So I, I don't have an official recommendation on that right now. Um, but I think you should absolutely bring it up with your doctor if you have more questions. And that's okay. You know, there's a lot of things that we don't know right now. And so mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's honest and fair to say we're not sure yet. There's a lot of things that are yeah. uncertain. And we are many, many months and, and years away from knowing a lot of these answers. So just want to let everybody know, um, you know, as you hear more and more information, you might hear different takes or different perspectives. And what's important is that you really do try to call your doctor. Um, if you typically go into a hospital when you need care, there are community health navigators there to help you find a primary care physician and start seeing someone very, very regularly and develop that relationship. It's really, really important. And it's a great way to stay connected. And as for follow-ups, we're going to talk about telehealth in, in a second, but it's great to have someone that you can follow up with who knows your medical history. And so if you're looking for a little bit of assistance on that, we can also point you in the right direction at my office. So I have a question here. I have a chronic medical issue. Is it finally safe to go to the doctor? Right. That's a really good question. And um, this is actually something I think everyone really needs to know. Um, it is now safe to go to the hospital and we would really recommend that people who have been holding out because of uh, fear of going to the hospital, uh, now is a good time to come back. Um, we are fortunately, uh, you know, we still are dealing with patients with coronavirus um, and, you know, a fair number of them. Um, but at this point, hospitals do have the capacity to be managing them separately um, and have the staff and they have the protocols um, to keep you safe uh, if you do not have coronavirus to come into the hospital and get treated. Um, I think it's, you know, it's unfortunate how um, care has often been uh, not available for people without coronavirus during this crisis. Um, and we are very worried about a lot of people who haven't been getting the care that they really should have been getting throughout uh, all of this. So, um, you know, we first of all, we thank everyone for hanging in there. And, uh, but we, you know, we we're here for you now. Um, I can assure you that um, at least within my hospital, um, there is a pretty good protocol uh, of keeping everyone safe and, um, and separated from other coronavirus patients. Um, everyone coming in gets screened um, before they even get into the emergency room. Uh, once they're in the emergency room, everyone who actually is admitted to the hospital um, will get a coronavirus test. Um, and um, we won't actually move them from the emergency room to a different wing of the hospital until that test is resulted. Uh, so we can do that quite quickly now. Um, so it's not perfect, but it is, um, when you compare it to community spread, um, I would say worth your while if you have a medical issue to come to the hospital. Well, that's great because someone actually asked, how is uh, Beth Israel keeping a uh, patient separated? So you got a quick kind of rundown. And what I've also heard from doctors and nurses is that they really do enjoy seeing, you know, non-COVID patients as well. They want you to come back. They want you to receive your services. Some people are regular patients. And as we're slowly, um, I guess, I guess we should say offering services, right now it's mostly time sensitive and, and urgent uh, surgeries and treatments, correct? Like I would say uh, cancer treatments are probably first and foremost as one of the things that is available and you'll start moving on to more elective surgeries and ambulatory care. Is that right? Or is there, what's kind of the process now that people can return? Are most things available? Um, so right now, not everything is available for everyone. It's kind of a, still kind of by most urgent need, but um, the, a few of those things, some surgeries, some elective surgeries as well, um, are available now. And um, it really, I, I can't speak for everyone. It depends on um, the specific providers and what their capacity is at any given moment. Um, but uh, at the very least, people who are sick um, need, need to get seen. And even if it means, um, delaying a surgery uh, at the very least we want to see you so we can find the best way to keep tie you over for that time um, it's important that we see you now um, and if you've had appointments canceled if you 
um, are kind of waiting to hear back, but you have an urgent medical issue, um, please get in contact with your doctors and um, try to see them as soon as possible. Um, it um, These things are changing pretty rapidly. So um, I know that um, it can be a little bit frustrating trying to talk to a lot of uh, doctor's offices, um, but we, being as a provider, we want to be there for you. Um, and it, it'll take a little bit of time, but I think right now is the time to start to at least to get, make those phone calls. Absolutely. And I, I just want to underline everything that Dr. Kwok just said. They really, really want individuals to start returning to the hospital for non COVID-19 care. So, you know, call and make that appointment, ask the question, if you don't feel well, you know, if it's something serious, pain in your arm or something's been troubling you for, for a while now throughout the pandemic, please go get uh, medical attention. And they're being very, very careful in our hospital system. And they certainly wanna see kind of the same numbers of people coming in for annual exams and regular treatment compared to last year. Again, everything's gonna be very, very different. Things are unknown. And the best thing is to just call, make that appointment and ask your doctor. So, okay, we got a question from Angelica Rosado who said, I know doctors don't always have all this information, but could you talk a little bit about how health insurance works with COVID-19 care? Hmm. Most insurances just cover testing and how about treatment? This is, that's a really good question. Um, and it's true, I don't have all the answers, but um, one thing I would recommend is if you have a concern, call your insurance uh, company directly because they're the only ones that can really give you the full answer. Um, and everyone's plan is different. Um, there are unfortunately um, going to be a lot of issues with people um, not getting reimbursed. Um, so it's really important that you're aware of that and that you, uh, you know, unfortunately, I wish this wasn't going to be such a big issue, but I don't have, uh, we can't guarantee that everything will be covered for you. Um, if you come to the hospital. Um, so please check with your insurance companies, um, ideally before, um, but of course, if it's a medical emergency, then you really can't wait. Absolutely. So, you know, just if you, if you need to seek care, right, go into the hospital. Many people are worried about their insurance. I think, um, you know, if you want to get a test, they, uh, many places offer them low cost and, and even free. So you can call 311, you can find a city MD, you can go to a health and hospitals, you can go to any one of the hospitals and, and they're going to, to help you and they're gonna really answer your questions. I think that the, the insurance issue was always a tricky one, right? You know, and people have very, very differences in opinions. I think what's gonna happen post COVID-19 is that this is a conversation that hopefully people are going to have a little bit more um, in depth, you know, we always talk about whether it's Medicare for all or if it's a choice or the Affordable Care Act and the expansion, whatever it was or is or whatever you um, really support, I think the, the, what the issue here is, is very systemic. And so some of our poorest individuals, people who speak English as a second language, are undocumented New Yorkers, they don't really have all the answers and they don't know where to go. So I know as we're expanding telehealth, and I've mentioned that a couple times, which is telemedicine, or you're here at different ways, which is how you can interact with your doctor online. I guess our goal is to make sure that one, we're addressing some of those issues as well, right? So there's access to internet, there is making sure that there is an interpreter always available and that people understand that, you know, they have to be culturally humble and sensitive when they're addressing some of the issues, because there is stigma there is a history of a lack of investment in certain neighborhoods. I think but what all doctors agree on is that that patient that they have right there in front of them, they're going to give them the very, very, very best care. And unfortunately, the insurance system and, and how our healthcare system kind of works, that, that is um, full of challenges and obstacles. And, and hopefully, we can kind of find the political leadership and courage to change that. I mean, that's my own personal opinion. Yeah, no, so, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, your leadership on that. I know it is absolutely a systemic issue um, and it's it's really not right. It's not fair. And um, we know that with good leadership, we can do this better. And um, I know, you know, you've been such a great supporter of uh, New York City hospitals um, that, you know, I really think that this, hopefully one thing from this crisis is, you know, going to be a push for reform. So I really hope that happens. Yeah, me too.
So um, actually someone, Julia Shell, she wanted to ask you, it gets a little, this is a little personal, but don't, don't be afraid. It says, Dr. Kwok, thank you for all you're doing. Working on the front lines, were you ever scared that you had symptoms or would get sick? Um, I mean, that, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking that. That's, uh, that's very nice of you. Um, I would say, yes, I mean, definitely there's times when, um, you know, in the hospital, you're, uh, you're never feeling 100%, right? I think, uh, you know, even if you're getting enough sleep, even if you're, you know, well-fed, uh, which we've been more well-fed lately, um, thanks to a lot of you, um, you know, you're, you're still not feeling 100% and you start questioning yourself, you know, do you have coronavirus? Do you, you know, are you sick for other reasons? Um, am I really um, fit enough to be taking care of all these people right now? And um, I think it helps to have, you know, a good team around you. And um, that's not just other physicians and nurses. There's a lot of people in the hospital who I think are very underappreciated. Uh, they really hold everything together. Um, so like the pharmacists, the spiritual care providers, um, a lot of the uh, environmental workers as well. Um, and, uh, you know, our food staff is, uh, you know, our, our heroes in their own right as well for keeping everything going for our patients, for us. Um, and uh, that, that kind of teamwork really helps kind of uh, support um, me on a daily basis, like at least I can say that for myself. But um, and uh, you know, being connected to the community is means the world to me personally. So um, being able to uh, talk with people tonight, um, to be able to get your messages, those things mean a lot to me as well. So yeah, thank you for asking. Of course, and I think you know, I think the the hospital that you're at, Mount Sinai, there they really try to be out at, at local fairs and events and, and to reach people and let them know that there are a number of services available um, in the district and just citywide. And, and I would ask, you know, you mentioned the, the spiritual care. So I know that clergy is very kind of involved in the hospital for people who are interested or just to have sort of an interfaith, again, spiritual uh, kind of, you know, healing, I think that goes on. And I, and I, th I do think that's important. And then, of course, just the mental health services that not just the, all of us that are going through the pandemic, but especially for, for you all who have seen some really, really tragic and, and, and inspiring things as well. But um, just making sure that you have those kinds of services, you know, we'll be fighting for that as well. And I know that that there are people you could talk to and therapists and there's um, I know there's teletherapy as well. Uh, but we just want to make sure that uh, we can be vocal and, and fight for you as well, because we know that, you know, you need to take care of yourselves as well. And, and you mean so much to us. So someone asked, how can we help doctors like yourself? Have you found it difficult to keep going day in and day out? And you mentioned a little bit about, you know, your energy. And I think we're all kind of feeling a little exhausted. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I imagine you have found it uh, difficult some days. So how can we help doctors like yourself? Um, so, I mean, first of all, thank you again. I mean, the, the support from the community has really um, been overwhelming and really, really appreciated. Um, and, you know, thank you, Carlina, for helping organize a lot of it. Um, I think um, the one thing, you know, you can hear about the PPE, um, I would say right now, um, we have enough for the short term. Um, we've done a good job. and um throughout you know including a lot of donations including a lot of really hard work by uh, both hospital staff and um, a lot of community members um i think we are in a place where at least i feel that each day i can go and have appropriate ppe um so that's really huge and it doesn't mean that we have to stop because unfortunately there's not really um a long-term plan for what those needs might be in the future um so while, there, while in, the, in the absence of that kind of plan, I think that's still something that we should be focusing on. Um, I think other ways to support, um, I think, again, I want also to say it's not just doctors, right? It's everyone in the hospital that I mentioned. Um, a lot of people, I think, who are getting less appreciation uh, that, that really deserve, you know, a lot of the people who are doing night shifts, a lot of um, the, the, the non-physician, non-nurse um, workers in the hospital uh, as well. So they deserve a lot of credit. Um, and um, other than that, it's really just taking care of each other. That's really what we want. Um, so, so you mentioned the, the PPE, right? So 
so how has PPE and, and supplies changed now that you aren't seeing so many cases? You, you said you feel, I guess, a bit more, a little, a sense of relief that you feel like you have enough for now, but, but you think that yeah. you maybe more in the future. Do you think that this will, you think that our healthcare and hospital systems will kind of rethink future plans and kind of their stock? Right, and I think in an ideal world, um, hospitals be working together, states will be working together to um, really figure out the numbers and figuring out what the need, where the needs are, how we can assure the short-term needs and the long-term needs. Um, right now, we don't have that. We only understand what's kind of within our system. Um, and, um, you know, I have to have a certain amount of uh, trust in my institution that they are really like investing in taking the money that they're getting from the federal government um, to be putting this into long-term planning um, for potential second surges, uh, third surges, and that kind of thing. Um, right now, uh, it's really hard to say. Um, all I can say is I feel better that at least for the next few weeks, I feel like I can go in and have appropriate PPE. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. And that's exactly, you know, what we want to hear. Um, you know, there's all, hospitals typically have, the, the city, which is a news outlet, they have this really great uh, website. They have a, a, a page there where it says how to donate individual things to, to certain hospitals. And, and most of the healthcare system, the hospital systems, they have a link on their page as to how you can donate. So certainly look into that. Did you wanna just mention really quickly about, about kind of the campaign and the thank you messages? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, this was something that was a really kind of small grassroots thing for uh, just originally just kind of the folks at Beth Israel. And um, again, it, this is all part of our desire to really be connecting with our community and knowing that while we aren't as able to engage in person with as many people, um, we still want to be, you know, um, reaching out. And um, we've, I got a lot of messages from people who were, were saying, I, you know, I want to wish everyone well. Um, and how do I do that? How do I pass along the messages? How do I contact hospital workers and just tell them, tell them thanks? So um, I just put together a Google form where people could just, you know, put, type in their messages and I would try to do my best to share it around the hospital. So um, I just never really expected how just overwhelming response that we get, um, you know, mainly from our neighborhood, which is amazing. And, uh, but also throughout, you know, across the world, it's, we have a really amazing international community that's based right here in the Lower East Side, you know. Um, and just, um, I so after a while, it got to the point where I couldn't really do it on my own. So I um, partially, I guess, Mount Sinai, um, uh, was able to kind of help to distribute a little bit more, send out messages, get some printing, um, putting in uh, messages around the hospital. So um, hopefully you haven't been in the hospital, but if you were, uh, if you walk around the hallways, there's all these messages that are pasted up on the walls. Um, and uh, as well as creating, um, I guess there's uh, the two of my friends really helped out a lot um, with an Instagram and uh, a website as well. So um, it's just been, just an incredible response. So I, I really appreciate everyone's help with this. Um, and if you want to uh, be in touch, if you want to send a message, um, I'll put, I'll paste the link, I guess, for the, uh, um, for the, it's called think, um, hospital heroes .com. It's, yeah. um, we'll put it in there. We'll put yeah. it, in. you don't, you don't, you don't have to worry. We just, we just appreciate your time. I know it's already eight Oh six and I told you 30 minutes. So if you don't mind, I have like one or two more questions. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, cool. So you heard, you can thank someone and there's a bunch of notes that went in from all over the world, which is really cool, but with a very special emphasis, I guess, of support, I should say, groundswell of support here in District 2 and kind of right around Mount Sinai and some of their facilities, which I think is really great. And I think New Yorkers are awesome. You know, we are really, we have really come together we're tough, we're united, we're loving, we're disciplined, but all in all, we just want to support each other because uh, we know that, um, you know, if you, if you can make it here, I mean, they say you can make it anywhere. So uh, I yeah. think New Yorkers are actually quite friendly and yeah. they really want to- I think that a stereotype is, you know, of New Yorkers not being nice is, is totally wrong. I mean, 
New Yorkers really take care of each other. They really believe strongly in the neighborhood and the community. Um, and they really fight an advocate for that. So I think that's something that has really shown itself during this. Um, I think during, I think it's, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, um, people wearing masks, not wearing masks in public, um, people kind of being rude to each other in public. And I think just we can get a little caught up in all these like kind of big public messages. Uh, I think it's really important just to just recognize that, you know, everyone's really going through a really tough time right now. And um, people can be suffering for any number of reasons. They can be, you know, have personal loss or the loss of um, a job, a loss of family member, a loss of just, just um, acknowledging the huge loss of life going on. Uh, so, Next time, you know, you see someone, even if they're not wearing a mask, you know, knowing that everyone's going through something right now. And um, hopefully, even as we don't have exact instructions on how to reopen, uh, if we still kind of understand what we are doing ourselves, and then as we go through interacting with people um, eventually in public, then just treating us, treating each other with kindness, treating each other um, as a neighbor, someone that we want to take care of. And... Uh, um, I think that is probably a more important thought than the really the, all the specific details. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, um, I think that we are really do look out for each other. And, and I think the other thing that people don't realize, a lot of people are going through this alone, right? Yeah. You know, I'm very lucky. I have my, my husband's here. I have a dog. I have a turtle. Like I have a whole little unit, you know, and, but not everyone has that. And so some people, some people actually live alone and they're going through this in that way. And so actually I wanted to just ask you two, you know, I guess a couple questions related to, to that. One is if I have COVID-19 or I think I have COVID symptoms that aren't serious and I want to stay home, I live alone and I want to self-quarantine, what are the best treatments I can use at home to relieve my symptoms? That's a great question. Um, so I know there is a little bit of conflicting advice out there um it depends on the symptom so um tylenol is always safe to use uh things like uh depending if you know if you have a fever tylenol um just cold you know anything cold compresses um supportive care like that that's really um kind of the bread and butter uh, if you have a lot of cough a lot of uh um difficulty breathing i mean in that case you really should be in the hospital um but uh I think uh, right now, um, if you have anything more than just um, something that can't be controlled with tyl Tylenol, um, cold compresses, that kind of thing, I I'd probably recommend th at least uh, seeing a doctor, if not getting them into the hospital. Right, right. Yeah, don't, you know, there's been some of our leadership who's recommended some things too, and, and we had to clear that up. Yes. So, you know, Tylenol safe, if, if, but if, you, if you're, you know, consistently right not feeling well or you think it might be serious, please, as we're saying, the hospitals are open. They're seeing patients who don't have COVID. And God forbid, if you do, they'll make sure that you get the treatment that you need. Yeah. So we have a question from uh, Jenny Hurwitz. On, she just on Facebook and she said, I'm due for a blood test for a chronic condition at a hospital this Friday. I'm afraid I will bring the virus home and worried my child could get the pediatric inflammatory multi-system multi disease yeah. that's being seen in some COVID cases. Yeah. How do hospitals make sure to separate, protect non-COVID patients? I think people are very, very worried about this. And this yeah. is why, you know, our important message here is that hospitals are being very, very careful. But Dr. Kwok, what do you, what do you have to say? Yeah, absolutely. So I 100% I agree that, um, you know, it, it, first of all, this new, um, I guess they're called like MISC um, affecting children is definitely very scary. Um, this is something that we don't have that much information about. Um, the good news is that it is very rare uh, as far as what we know so far. Um, in terms of you're going to getting a blood test, going to the hospital, um, I don't know um, how urgent this blood test is if your doctor is recommending it, I think it's probably still a good idea to get it. Um, I think that um, the, depending on um, the hospital, you, you know, I think it's appropriate to go. Um, and of course, when you go there, uh, you just be mindful of the way that you go there. 
in terms of if you're taking an Uber or if you're walking, all those trying to minimize risks as much as possible. Um, but it is, if you have a chronic, chronic medical condition, those tests are probably pretty important. Um, so I think it's worth going. And uh, I, I mentioned the kind of protocols that we take uh, once you're there. So, um, you know, we have those protocols in place to protect you, to protect us. And um, fortunately, it seems like uh, healthcare workers have been reasonably well protected. Um, and so we know it's working. Um, I'm not saying the risk is, isn't zero, uh, but if you have a chronic medical condition, I think it's worth doing. Well, there you have it. I know, I don't know about you, but if I walked in and they told me that my doctor was going to be Dr. Kwok, I'd feel pretty confident. Um, you not only explain things really, really well, if I could just say you just have a very kind of personable, friendly approach. And I think that's, nice you say. that's, that's what, you know, people need. And so uh, for those of you who didn't see, uh, Dr. Kwok is at, at the beginning of, I think, a very long, lustrous, very successful career. You're going to be great in whatever you do, and we support you. I've uh, been covered in a couple of local outlets, the New York Post, um, and I know you have a, a lot a lot more ahead of you. We'll be cheering for you every step of the way, and we just want to thank you. Thank you so, so much for doing this, for being so committed uh, to this calling, to this vocation of yours, and for doing it um, really so inclusively, always recognizing, you know, the security guards and custodial and the food staff and the nurses and, and the admin. I think that's just really reflective of kind of uh, the medicine that you practice, which is that, um, you know, you want to take care of people and you want to remember every single person that's there, right? So it's, a, it's our community and uh, we all have to do our part to take care of each other. So I really appreciate them. Support, but um, yeah, I mean, thank you, everyone. So we're gonna let you go. I know you're probably very busy. I hope that you're doing things for fun and that you get to relax. I know that you said that you, uh, before we kind of went live, that you're doing a pilot for telehealth, right? So you're yeah, starting- Yeah, I mean, we're trying it out. You know, we're, uh, it's still not not perfect, but we, are, we want to see all of our patients that we haven't been able to see. So um, hopefully telehealth will help with that. Okay, and we'll be supporting you in that effort as well, making sure that people have, you know, can can access telehealth, that there are interpreters so people can speak in the language that makes them feel the most comfortable and that they get the best quality care. And that's very, very much in large part, thanks to Dr. Kwok for being such a brilliant physician and for being so kind and gracious as to come and talk to us for a little bit. Thank you so, so much. And thank you so much for having me, Carolina. All right, I hope to see you in the neighborhood soon. Hope so, take care. From a safe distance. <laughs> exactly. All right, so there he was, Dr. Kwok, isn't he the best? Um, really, really just good, nice person who wants to make sure that whenever anyone walks into the space that he is in or the facility where he is practicing medicine that they feel like someone is listening, um, that they see a friendly face and that they understand that Dr. Kwok and, the, and his colleagues are going to do every everything in their power to make sure that you feel like, again, you're being heard and that you receive the best quality care. You know, we have some amazing hospitals, physicians, nurses, just generally uh, healthcare staff in this city, and they have been working day in and day out tirelessly. So I'm really, really glad that we got a chance to ask a few questions, to clear up a couple, I think, misconceptions and misinformation, but also to just be very, very honest with you all in saying that we don't have all the answers. And we are days, weeks, months, and years away from being able to address every single thing that people want to know about, including when is the vaccine going to be available? Um, should I get tested? Should I, should I go to the hospital? The short answer on that is you should go to the hospital if you don't feel well. Uh, they're open, they wanna make sure that they're seeing you and they actually genuinely look forward to seeing patients. Um, and you know, uh, I encourage you to make sure that you call your doctor should you have any issues. So we have a couple questions that have come in that I wanna make sure uh, that I address, um, including one from Rola Eisner. Rola, I hope I said your name correctly. It said, I would appreciate a clarification of mask policy in residential buildings. I'm a rental tenant in a condo and was told that the board did not vote to require masks in public areas. 
So there are no signs requiring masks and elevators, laundry room, et cetera. But we must take the elevator to dispose of garbage and to use the laundry room. I've been terrified ever since um, I saw people without mask. They had been talking. Then the, what about the droplets? I'm a senior citizen. Okay, well, this is a very, very real and valid concern. Um, and I appreciate the level of detail that you're sharing about your personal experience. And I'm sorry, Rola, if you ever felt unsafe. No one wants to feel unsafe in their own home, let alone their own building. So I will tell you that masks should be worn in enclosed public places at all times. If someone is not wearing a mask in your building or not socially distancing properly, you should contact 311 and you should again try to you know, distance yourself. I know that not everyone is behaving. I was outside um, you know, this past weekend on a bike ride and, and, and most people I would say were wearing masks. They were trying to do the right thing. Uh, but there certainly are some people who aren't. So again, I just want to tell you, Rola, I'm sorry that you went through that and you felt unsafe. They should be wearing masks. There should be proper signage. Um, perhaps you could reach out to the people on the board or some of your neighbors and ask that they contact management as well. I think it makes perfect sense to have signs there reminding people of their obligation. And, and quite frankly, as we've heard, to just show respect for the other people of, in New York City. We are not at the point where we can walk outside without masks or to take any sort of unnecessary risk at this point. It is very, very, very risky and dangerous to think so. And again, we are weeks away from, from opening, reopening up as a city. And again, even that, um, even that kind of phrasing is, is somewhat relative. So let's keep it moving and see what else we've got here. Okay. I've been following your, this is from Alice Burstein. I've been following your emailed updates and appreciate them. You're welcome. By the way, my team, my staff put so much time into making sure that we put together uh, e-newsletters that don't hit your inbox every day, but a couple times a week. We have graphs and info, and we have all sorts of resources that include, you know, for people who are living through domestic violence, for people who may need mental health support, finding food, activities, whether you're an adult or a child, senior services, technology support. So we put all that in there because we want people to, you know, if you have a question, you can say, oh, let me go back to the councilwoman's email and you can find it right there. And if you don't, our contact information is there as well and we're happy to address what your concern is. So Alice goes on to say, however, um, today's, oh, this is good. today's comment that we would be better with universal healthcare is misplaced. It doesn't work well in other countries. Mm. See, this is how you know it's live, right? Because I'm taking Alice's question. Maybe Alice and I, you know, we, Maybe we disagree, maybe not. What I would say is that we make, let, let's make sure that we aren't confusing universal access to healthcare with having a strong public health system in place to deal with outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases. Clearly Italy did not put preventative public health measures like social distancing in place soon enough. So, and while Italy has universal healthcare system, and I don't mean to, to, to use this example over and over again, but they seem to be the kind of clearest uh, um, example, Italy, while Italy does have universal health care system and a bad outbreak of COVID-19, there have been no indications that the mortality rate in Italy was due to the health care system being universal. So there are many reasons that, that deaths in Italy were so high. I mean, in, including the fact that Italy has one of the oldest populations in the world and that a large percentage of the population uh, smoke. So COVID-19 is considerably more lethal in older individuals and smokers. I think you all would remember when we had Dr. Katz on, he's the president and CEO of Health and Hospitals. Um, he gave a short PSA on smokers and, and, and making sure that people were, were making healthy decisions. So I would say that, um, you know, that is, that's why I think it's not necessarily a, a, a safe, a safe comparison. I think that we can certainly look at how to reform our healthcare system and do this in a way 
that I think would be fair and equitable for those people who have historically lacked access. So I do stand by that statement and I think we can do it by learning from other countries as well. So I want to give a couple of quick updates as well because I do see a, a question about unemployment and a question about small business and we typically, and also noise, and we typically get these questions almost every week. So I wanna give you a few updates on that just generally before we close out. So I've received a lot of questions from small businesses uh, who have concerns about paying the rent, about um, what's gonna happen with the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a federal program um, in which many small businesses have started to, they've applied and received funds. And again, we keep, we continue to hope that the next uh, tranche of funding that comes from Washington is gonna have a considerable amount for New York City. It has in the past, but, but certainly we are in dire need of financial assistance. I will tell you that as a council member right now, we're discussing the city budget and we are looking at very, very, very serious cuts to programs and services. So right now we're trying to prioritize, look at what's essential, looking at healthcare and food and housing and education and making sure that we're always thinking of our arts and culture programs because I think our therapy will be very, very important as we go forward and dealing with some of the mental health support um, issues that, that we're gonna see in the next coming weeks. But also people who are certainly wanna go back and reopen their business when it's appropriate or go to full service, which won't be for a very, very long time. And I will tell you that small businesses will likely open uh, in the future at a reduced capacity with some serious social distance going on. Um, and then there, there are others who feel like maybe they'll never be able to reopen their business, which is really, really sad because people have poured their whole, their dreams and, and their lives and countless hours into fulfilling a vision that they had for this service, for this restaurant, for whatever it is, this small business. And so sometimes there's something called a, a personal liability that is included and which is something that we wanted to take care of because no one saw this disaster coming. So for people to be held personally liable, which is mean that their assets and, and their personal finances uh, could be um, in jeopardy if they are not able to keep up with their commercial rent payments for et cetera. We wanted to make sure that we were protecting small businesses again during this crisis. So a temporary suspension of personal liability in commercial leases was a bill that I introduced. It was called Intro 1932. It passed the city council. It was it was actually uh, uh, signed today by the mayor. Very, very exciting. It was a historic moment. It was the first time in New York City history that a bill was signed virtually. So that's cool. Um, but also I think what's most important is that we were able to move a package of bills that really does support small businesses. And sometimes when you're in the council, you know, you feel limited in what you can do. And there are our colleagues in the state level, right? In the state Senate and in the assembly. And then there are also our colleagues in Washington. So sometimes we, you know, we're really trying to think creatively and innovatively on how we can help um, our small businesses. Hold on. Mm, just trying to put the light on. But um, what, we, what we did was we passed a number of bills that helped delivery workers, that helped uh, restaurants who were being charged a high percentage for some of those third party apps that we order from. And then um, my bill that I mentioned, personal liability. I was so grateful to hear from many small business owners in district two about the relief and support that this bill means for them. Um, you know, from some of our favorite businesses I've heard from, Ninth Street Espresso and B-Side and just a number of others just across the city. So that's been really cool to see that uh, uh, legislation that I introduced could really, really help people during the crisis. And as for all of the individuals who have asked a little bit about some of the noise and the construction updates, I will tell you that uh, noise pollution has all, always, always, always been one of my priorities. I typically get complaints about two types of noise, right? One is about bar noise, and that's been a little bit tapered now, though we're making sure that we're staying on top of some of the crowds that are congregating in front of some of these takeout windows. And uh, the ninth precinct, which is one of the six precincts that cover my district actually has, the NYPD has a, a like a campaign that says takeout, don't hang out, okay? 
So if it's not bar noise though, I do get a lot of complaints about construction noise. And I know that with many of us working from home and social distancing, construction can be particularly challenging right now. So if you're concerned that a construction site near you is not deemed essential, or if you observe any concerning behavior or after hours construction, please call 311. The Department of Buildings also maintains a real time essential construction map that you can check directly. I'll post the link to their site in, in the comments now and you, can, and you can check that out when you can. And of course, you could always follow up with our office. You can email us at district2, so that's D-I-S-T-R-I-C-T, -I -I the number two, at council.nyc.gov. And we, we will check in with the Department of Buildings on your behalf, of course. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll cover before we close out, and, and again, we get these questions every week uh, on unemployment. I, have re I receive emails from people all over the city who have issues in, in getting, you know, not just submitting their claim, but, you know, wondering when the funds, when they'll finally receive these funds, people going weeks without receiving a, a dollar of income into their household. So let me just add, um, there have been a number of recent updates at the State Department of Labor and their partnership with Google. So more New Yorkers are gonna be able to, to finish filing their claims online without needing to speak to a representative on the phone. So if people get to the end of the application and there is still an unanswered question, they're now gonna receive a call from the Department of Labor within 72 hours. And this is also true for New Yorkers who previously filed online and were told to call the department back, as well as people who partially filed but did not finish by phone. Um, a staff member should now be calling all of you back. And so if this is something that you're, you're not seeing or you're not getting that call and you're getting worried, you know, please, please contact us. Many constituents have reached out to me and my staff because they have still experienced some pretty serious delays. And we're working with our state colleagues to solve these problems because unemployment is run at the state level. And thankfully through their oversight abilities, they are able to get a better response from the State Department of Labor. So make sure uh, to look up who your state rep is first if you're having problems. I have a couple here that overlap in my district, including Brian, uh, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh and State Senator Brad Hoyleman, um, so and State Senator Liz Krueger. So look them up. Again, they've helped hundreds and hundreds of people, and they still have many, many cases. So we're trying our best. And of course, you can feel free to, to email us at district2 at council.nyc.gov if you need assistance connecting with your state representative. We have done it countless times. Uh, just earlier today, I was answering emails for people who are having issues. So I realize that it is not um, a perfect system in any way, uh, whether it comes to your personal finances or your professional life, or you don't know what's next. Uh, there is a lot unknown and I think this is what I appreciated so much about my conversation with Dr. Kwok is that he was very, very candid about things he doesn't know. So I hope that um, you all found this uh, helpful, that you got some of your questions um, answered and want to make sure... Uh, 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 okay, let me make sure we'll do that. Okay, so I mean, if you have any questions, please let us know. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. It really, really means a lot. Um, please let us know if you need anything else. I know that uh, we continue to do food deliveries. So if anyone is comfortable with going out there and delivering to folks, uh, we're out there all the time. If you're not quite ready to come outside and, and, and deliver with us, Again, we provide masks and gloves to be safe. And I have delivered uh, meals all over the district with people. And sometimes uh, with the same few people who continue to come back. So I just wanna thank you all, because I know that we see each other and we're starting to recognize each other even with the mask on. And then if, if you'd like to work remotely, you know, we give people a list of, of individuals that we call uh, with a script, with a list of resources, and if people have questions so we could refer them properly follow up and always, always, always remind people to please fill out the census. I'm not sure if you saw the numbers, but we're not doing too well. Some areas are doing better than others. I'm not gonna pick, 
and choose who we talk about because we're all one New York. So please fill out the census. It takes 10 minutes and it's gonna determine the next 10 years of funding for our communities and possibly up to two seats in Congress. And I don't know about you, but I want every single representative that's in our congressional delegation to be able to return and to fight for our neighborhoods. So join me in filling out the census. I did it, it's super fast. You can do it online, over the phone. You might've even received it by paper. Please fill out the census again. It's quick, it's easy. And it's really something that you can do for your community, honestly. So again, I wanna thank everyone. If you need anything, let me know. I hope you all had a good holiday. It's gonna be a hot summer. We are working on things to make sure that people feel like there are still services and, and programs available for our young people, for our seniors and for everyone in between. I'm so thankful to be your representative and I am so, so glad that uh, you joined us today. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you.